Thank you all for coming to, to what is seminar today. So um, Tanya Holiday is an assistant professor in the Department of Health and Kinesiology at the University of Utah. She's my PI as you um, probably know already. Um, her research focuses on appetite and food intake regulation in response to lifestyle interventions such as diet and exercise um, and weight loss. She has done much work investigating how type of exercise, so either aerobic or resistance exercise, influences hormonal and behavioral indices of appetite. Um, Dr. Holiday has also examined how sex as a biological variable may influence appetite response to energy deficits elicited from exercise or diet. Another current research of, uh, of research focus for her is developing effective weight loss maintenance strategies. So a little bit more about Tanya. So she started at the University of uh, Wyoming, where she published her first peer-reviewed article as an undergraduate student, which is likely where her spark for academic research started and her appreciation for the potency of great mentorship um, likely began. She then completed her dietetics internship at the University of Houston and then went on to receive her PhD in clinical physiology and metabolism from Virginia Tech, where her research focused on exercise and dietary interventions for the prevention and treatment of obesity and the related cardiometabolic conditions. She then um, got her got a postdoc position at um, CU Anschutz in the um, Division of Endocrinology, Metabolism, and Diabetes in the Department of Medicine. Um, and she, uh, during her postdoc, not only was she conducting her research, but she was also working as a registered dietitian. So um, Tanya has always been very busy and very impressive. Um, and a little bit more, I could like talk forever about Tanya, so I like really had to trim down what I was going to say. But um, so Tanya also received the College of Health Distinguished Mentor Award last year. And impressively, this was the first time in the history of the award that it was awarded to an assistant professor. So just kind of demonstrates her outstanding skill set as a mentor. Um, she collaborates across disciplines and across the translational spectrum. She's well published, she's well funded, and her work has even been featured in the New York Times. Uh, Tanya is a true team scientist and an outstanding leader. In her spare time though, um, you can find her trail running with her dog, Lily, riding her horse, also named Lily, <laughs> skiing, or just like being a beacon of joy, lighting up some room in some capacity. So um, with that, please welcome, or please join me in welcoming uh, Dr. Holiday, and then I will turn it over to you, Tanya. <laughs> Thanks, Queen. And I just want to clarify, I didn't name my dog or my horse. They just were rescue animals that both came into my life with the same name. Um, but I guess if I have a daughter, she will also just have to be named Lily at this point. So that's hilarious. Though. I know, it's not funny. Yeah, that's my like fun fact I always share. <laughs> Um, so today, um, I'm like really super excited about um, meeting with you all, and I love this whole like pretty open ended what is thing. I was like, like what is? I don't know. We can talk about anything. Um, and so I wanted to bring in a little bit of my research, but also a topic that I think it might just be of interest to most people as well. And so I titled it, "What is the role of physical activity in weight management?" Oh, open for this being plenty interactive, so feel free to interrupt at any point if you have questions or want to chime in. And to get us started, if you were to, and you can just shout this out or type in the chat box, whatever you prefer, what do you think in general the role of physical activity is in weight management? Do you think it's helpful for weight management or do you think it potentially undoes some of our uh, weight management efforts by driving up our appetite perhaps? Does anyone have like a take either like personally how you feel after you exercise? I personally, just so you know, for me, I feel like, okay, so I worked out today, I can have a little treat, right? So the first, instead of thinking I have to be in calorie deficit, I'm like, hey, I exercised today, I burned so many calories, I love my smartwatch that tells me that I've moved so many minutes and so many calories, so days when I just want to find an excuse, I'll think I exercised, yeah. I'm just, I deserve that huge ice cream or I'm a chips <laughs> lover so I deserve the huge bag of family size chips <laughs> but that's me yep I yep I hear you on that does anyone else feel similar or does anyone else maybe have like a different uh experience Sarah has some uh comments in the chat oh perfect yeah can you I can't actually see them can you raise that oh, oh. 
So yeah, helpful and may increase body mass. So muscle mass, but that's okay. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And we'll talk a little bit about exercise modality as we go. Um, cool. Anyone else have thoughts they want to share? I was just going to say that exercise often decreases my appetite, especially when I used to run before my knees hated me. Um, and, and then I wouldn't want to eat for a long time. But then what I've read, though, it seems like people overestimate the amount of calories that they burn by exercise. And then so we're all like, Lila, we're waiting then like, oh, I, I ran. So now I can eat something like 600 calories, but we only burned 150. And so it could cause not prevent or not facilitate weight loss because you're like making that trade off. And that trade off is all not always what you think it's going to be. Yeah. Like, I'm totally hundred percent with you though. I am totally with you. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. These are all I mean, incredibly accurate things that everyone has said. And even though that they're kind of contradictory, they're all actually true. So, um, so we'll go through, um, oh, come on, advanced slides. There we go. Uh, so we'll broadly answer, you know, what is the role here? And in that, we'll review the current physical activity guidelines for weight management and talk a little bit about how exercise impacts appetite, which has been a focus um, of my research. In general, these are our physical activity guidelines for Americans. Our latest ones um, came out in 2018. And what's recommended is that everyone achieve 150 to 300 minutes per week of moderate intensity physical activity or 75 to 150 minutes a week of vigorous intensity physical activity or some combination of the two. Uh, it's also recommended to perform muscle strengthening or resistance exercise activity two times per week hitting all major muscle groups. And so that could be a full body routine that you do twice per week or you could break it up and say, I'm going to do upper body twice a week, lower body twice a week. Um, so kind of whatever people prefer there. Now, in the latest edition of the guidelines, they had a section specifically focused on the role of physical activity in preventing weight gain. And what they concluded, and, and in order to do this, they did a systematic review of trials that included at least one year of follow-up data. And they concluded that strong scientific evidence shows that physical activity helps people maintain a stable weight over time and can reduce the risk of excessive weight gain and the incidence of diabetes. However, people vary a great deal in how much physical activity they need to achieve and maintain a healthy weight. Uh, the relationship here is usually most pronounced above that standard 150 minutes per week of moderate um, or vigorous intensity physical activity. Um, and while additionally, muscle strength activities can help provoke, promote weight maintenance um, and not to the same degree as aerobic exercise. And this figure here displays the odds of maintaining a healthy weight. And this was defined based upon body mass index, which is not always the best measure of weight status at the individual level, but it works really well at the population level. And that's defined as having a BMI, um, so ratio of your weight to your height of 18.5 to less than 25. And the reference group here was set at less than 0.75 met hours per week. And that's a term you may not be familiar with, but um, if we were to take that 150 minutes to 300 minutes a week of moderate to vigorous intensity physical activity and convert it to this MET unit, which stands for metabolic equivalence. And it's how much above resting energy expenditure you're doing. Um, our guidelines for 150 to 300 minutes per week would fall right in here around that 8.3 to 16.7 MET hours per week. Um, and so what you can see here is that with increasing volume of physical activity, the risk of maintaining or like the likelihood that you would maintain a healthy weight is going to be increased. So in this case, the odds ratio going up is actually a beneficial outcome. So moving on to look at physical activity guidelines for weight loss, the, um, the latest edition of the physical activity guidelines for Americans did not focus on weight loss. And so we need to go back to actually 2009 ACSM position stand. And what we see is a dose response relationship exists between level of physical activity and degree of weight loss that we can expect. At less than 150 minutes per week, that's gonna promote very minimal weight loss. 
greater than 150 minutes per week, you can expect that you or a client, a patient um, would lose about two to three kilograms of weight loss. In order to achieve more substantial weight loss in the five to seven and a half uh, kilogram range, you would need to engage in between 225 to 420 minutes per week. Resistance exercise um, on its own doesn't do much for weight loss at an absolute level, but like Sarah had commented, um, could be very important in changing body composition, which would be beneficial in decreasing fat mass, increasing uh, lean mass. And this dose can response, ask, yeah. Can I ask you a question, Kind of, Can you go back? Yeah. What is that time period? So if it says promote approximately five to seven point kilograms, of weight loss is that per week over the course of a year over the course of a month oh yeah that's a good point yeah i wish it was a month right wouldn't that be nice um no it's usually over a range of about six to 12 months of an intervention okay. that you could expect that um but then you will eventually at some point kind of plateau unless you're going to also add some diet induced weight loss um or increase that that volume um, thank you yeah, and so this figure here actually shows this pretty well. So this um, dose-response relationship has been shown multiple times. So I've just pulled a few representative studies with weight change on the y-axis, and then each line on each of these figures represents a different volume of physical activity. And then time is on the x-axis and goes out to either 18 or 24 months. And for most of these studies, the intensive period where it was supervised weight loss was either in that first six or that first 12 months. Um, and so what we see is that the lines on each graph that had a greater volume of physical activity resulted in a greater degree of weight loss. And while that's encouraging, right, that we can exercise, we can use it to elicit weight loss and create a caloric deficit, I do want to point out that. Um, on average, the amount that we're gonna lose with exercise is pretty small, particularly when we compare it to other interventions that we have, um, such as pharmaceuticals. So I have added, um, this is placebo subtracted weight loss here and different interventions, exercise being in that red bar and then um, different types of pharmaceuticals on uh, in each of the black bars. And our newest ones that have kind of come out more recently um, and been approved for uh, weight loss are semaglutide and uh, trazepatide. And these are GLP-1 receptor agonists. And I also didn't put on this graph bariatric surgery, but had we added this, it actually would go off of the chart. Um, and so kind of the, the main goal here is that like, yes, you, we can lose exercise, use exercise for weight loss, but we may want to, if we're working with patients, if we're working with clients, um, suggest that people talk with their physicians about maybe some other types of um, anti-obesity medications to add on as well, if they need and desire greater weight loss. Um, and so perhaps, you know, why is exercise not as effective as we think it is? Um, and it could just be that public perception, you know, it kind of seems to be that exercise increases our appetite and particularly for calorically dense foods, and therefore it's gonna increase energy intake and thus being ineffective for weight loss. So I was actually an undergrad um, doing research in a lab on vitamin D, but the lab also did research on um, gut hormones involved in appetite at the same time. And this Time Magazine article came out and it kind of made a big splash at the time, um, basically making the case that exercise is ineffective for weight loss. And I don't think our perception has really changed much since this time. And there is data to support this. So this was um, a study done recently by uh, a person that I went to grad school with. We were in the same lab. Um, and he's kind of gotten into this exercise and appetite space as well. And um, what he showed was that in adults with obesity, an acute bout of exercise, so um, exercise on the left side of this figure and a sedentary condition where they watch TV on the right figure. So an acute bout of exercise that expended 500 calories compared to a bout of TV watching actually increased fixation on food cues post-exercise. So this was looking at attentional bias towards a food cue and an increase in that, in that bar graph for the exercise shows that after exercise, people were paying more attention to those food-based cues. And it could explain why weight loss from physical activity is less than expected based solely on the caloric expenditure. 
And in one way, this is true. So shown here um, is predicted weight loss in the black line and actual weight loss of participants at each time point kind of in these black squares across um, a 24 week intervention. Um, however, when we examine weight change at the individual level and not at the mean level, like is shown here, the story becomes a little bit more complicated. And here is some uh, data from a study that I did during my postdoc looking at weight change um, comparing a 12-week diet-based intervention to a 12-week aerobic exercise intervention. And the diet group is shown in green and the exercise group is in blue. And then each individual participant is in a little circle for the diet group or a triangle for the exercise group. And we can see that weight change for the diet group, while there is some spread and some people losing a lot more weight, some people losing less, in general, everyone was, for the most part, losing weight or at least not increasing their weight. Whereas we look at the exercise group, we have such a large spread. We have some people gaining over three kilograms during this 12 week and some people losing close to seven kilograms during that same time. And I did put up the, the FM and the FFM stand for fat mass and fat free mass. And I did just want to put those up there just to make the point that the exercise group was not gaining weight because they were putting on a lot of lean mass. Um, it was fat mass that was being gained as well, which did differ between those groups. Um, so basically we think that um, it's important that we look at these individual responses because we look at only the mean difference. It doesn't quite tell the whole story. And so from this same, um, same project, if we look just at the exercise groups, we ask the question, what could potentially be leading to these different outcomes? And we look at this a few different ways. And one thing that could be a contributor is appetite-related hormones. So what I'm showing here is baseline and post-intervention bar graphs for area under the curve. Responders, those who lost at least 3% of their body weight um, are shown in the gray bars. And then non-responders, people who didn't achieve that weight loss or potentially gained weight are shown in the white bars. Um, as you can see, there's no difference in area under the curve for ghrelin, which is known to be an appetite stimulating hormone. And there's also no difference in these groups in GLP-1, which is a satiety hormone. And while it's not statistically significant, um, we do see the responders tend to have higher PYY, which is another satiety hormone at both baseline and follow-up compared to that non-responder group. And when we examine the individual time points um, in postprandial PYY response, it's a little bit hard to tell, but the 180 minute or the three hour time point was higher at baseline in both the responders and the non responders, or sorry, uh, it was higher at baseline in the responders than the non responders. And so that data was from a training study. They were there for 12 weeks, exercising four to five days per week. Um, but these outcomes can also be impacted by a lot of other things that might be happening in those people's lives over that 12 weeks. So I think it's also important that we look at some acute exercise data to see how exercise acutely impacts our appetite. And shown here is a forest plot from a meta-analysis that was done looking at how acute exercise impacts appetite hormones. And each of the lines kind of leading down um, to the bottom of this figure is an individual study with lines to either left of the center, indicating a decrease in ghrelin, which is that hunger hormone, and any um, lines to the right of that center dotted line would be an increase in ghrelin, so an increase in hunger. And when we look at the overall mean response, this last um, uh, little figure here, we see that there is a slight decrease overall in ghrelin levels in response to acute exercise. And when we look at the satiety hormones, PYY, we see a slight increase in PYY in response to acute exercise. And the same thing, a slight increase in that GLP-1 and our other satiety hormone in response to acute exercise. And typically, um, this is a meta-analysis, every study was a little bit different. Um, but for the most part, these were showing um, res these hormonal responses post-exercise anywhere from like three to six hours post-exercise. So acutely, uh, what we think is that exercise seems to be appetite suppressing, which I think was mentioned by some people that, hey, initially, like, especially, you know, if you're running, your appetite is suppressed for a little bit. Um, 
Now, however, the most of the work that's been done in this space on exercise and appetite regulation, and really just on exercise and any health outcome in general, is predominantly focused on aerobic exercise. And I had a brief stint as a bodybuilder when I was in grad school. And so I'm always like, well, what about resistance exercise? Like, what is it doing to all of these outcomes? Um, and so I've really been interested in looking at how resistance exercise impacts appetite. And again, we did a study to directly compare an acute bout of resistance to aerobic exercise to a sedentary control condition. And what we saw was that following about a 45 minute bout of exercise conducted after breakfast, ghrelin was reduced most in the resistance exercise group compared to both the sedentary and aerobic groups, suggesting that potentially resistance exercise may suppress hunger more than aerobic exercise does. Um, however, when we look at the satiety hormones, it gets a little bit more complicated because the aerobic exercise group actually resulted in a greater PYY response compared to that resistance exercise. And that same outcome was shown with these GLP-1, particularly elevated at the 90-minute um, post-meal time point. Um, and so lastly, in addition to kind of these indirect measures of appetite, we do look at actual food intake. Um, at baseline and post in, uh, intervention, this is going back to that 12 week study, um, we test uh, energy intake in two ways. And so the first is we do bring people into the lab, we do that meal tolerance test. And then after our three hour blood draw, we give them about an 1800 calorie lunch and they're allowed to eat as much of it or as little as they want. Um, and we can get a sense of sort of uh, at least we can get, a, get an accurate measure of energy intake, whether that represents habitual energy intake is really debatable though. Um, and in this uh, group of responders versus non-responders to aerobic exercise, we did not see any difference in their in-lab energy intake. The other way that we look at this in a really objective way is we provide three days of free living ad libitum intake. And so we would provide people with much greater calories than they needed for three days, all of their meals, plus a bunch of snacks. And we have them return back what they don't eat each day. And we can see that at both baseline and follow-up, that non-responder group, so the group that either didn't lose weight or perhaps even gained some weight with this exercise intervention, was eating more calories, whereas the responder group um, was eating less throughout that whole time. Um, and I didn't show this data, but the responder group also reported greater satiety at baseline and post, as well as lower hedonic hunger than the non-responder group. And if we go back to that acute exercise meta-analysis, in addition to uh, the appetite hormones, uh, this same group did a, a subsequent meta-analysis looking specifically at energy intake. And they're showing that acute exercise tends to decrease food intake. So if we were to kind of summarize what we know about how exercise impacts appetite and weight loss or weight management, I would say that acutely exercise may suppress appetite and potentially energy intake. And with chronic exercise, weight loss responses may be due more so to individual appetite differences that are present at baseline and be less likely to be impacted by the exercise intervention. And finally, in addition to, we looked at weight, you know, preventing weight gain, we looked at weight loss. Um, I think it's also important to look at how exercise impacts weight loss maintenance. And so the guidelines here, again, going back to that 29 or 2009 ACSM position stand, recommend that we get at least 200 to 300 minutes per week of physical activity in order to prevent gaining weight after we've lost it. Um, however, there's really not enough evidence in this area to provide strong recommendations. And so in general, the best we can kind of say is more physical activity is going to be better for preventing weight regain. So I'm again pulling up these dose response figures that I showed in response to weight loss, because we can see that after that initial exercise period, there is some weight regain shown by each of those lines going back towards zero or no weight loss. But with the greater amounts of physical activity, you are preventing some degree of that weight regain over time. And what about exercise modality? So there is very little evidence related to the role of resistance exercise on weight loss and maintenance. Um, it is worthwhile to consider. And what I've pulled here is some data from the National Weight Control Registry. 
And what this registry is, is it was started at the University of Colorado um, and also by Rena Wing, um, who's on the East Coast. And people who have lost a substantial amount of weight and maintained it for at least one year are eligible to enroll in this registry. And they're sent surveys um, to fill out periodically. And so we have a lot of information about exercise and people who've successfully lost weight and kept it off from this uh, cohort. Um, and so what we know is that the types of physical activity reported by participants in this registry is predominantly walking. So um, over 80% of participants report that they engage in walking, which is a type of aerobic exercise, and that helps them to maintain their weight loss. When we look down at resistance training, only about a third report engaging in any resistance exercise. And so while resistance training may play a role in weight loss maintenance, it doesn't seem to be required in order to maintain weight loss. Um, but of course, again, I'm only focusing on absolute weight loss here and not even getting into body composition differences. Obviously, there's gonna be a lot of benefits to resistance exercise aside from any changes to absolute body weight. Um, one of the few randomized controlled trials that's looked at resistance training for weight loss maintenance enrolled only women who had overweight and obesity, put them through a diet and exercise intervention for them to lose at least 12 kilograms of weight. And then they were randomized to a one-year maintenance um, intervention where they did either two times a week aerobic exercise or two times a week resistance exercise. And uh, what I've made here is a figure from that data looking at one-year change. So anything above zero means they regained some weight. And aerobic exercise is in the black box and uh, resistance exercise is in the red bars. And you see pretty even weight regain um, and I've broken it down by area. So arm fat, leg fat and trunk fat. So pretty even weight regain between groups, maybe a little bit greater weight regain in that resistance group, um, but they don't believe they reported um, body composition in that study. So to summarize, um, exercise can elicit weight loss, though the effects are generally pretty modest. An increased volume, at least of aerobic exercise, increases weight loss and weight loss maintenance. And weight loss results are not homogenous at all um, and seems to be due to changes in appetite and or I didn't even present the data, but potentially changes to non-exercise physical activity as well that might occur in response to an exercise intervention. However, um, our participation in physical activity as a nation is generally pretty poor. Um, so that would probably be the first place we would want to start is just increasing people who meet the guidelines. Um, so what I'm showing here is uh, this black section of this uh, bar chart. About 50% of the population do not meet either aerobic or resistance exercise guidelines. Um, so, you know, about 20% meet both. Um, a small percent meet only muscle. Um, and a certain percent meet only aerobic. And so this is definitely represents an area for, you know, particularly those engaged in translational research to help with dissemination and then implementation of our physical activity guidelines into clinical and community settings. And so with that, um, some acknowledgements, um, all the great folks that I worked with during my postdoc at Anschutz, um, a team that I get to work with here at the University of Utah, and then of course, um, all the, the students, trainees in my lab. So with that, I'd love to open it up to questions um, or just a conversation. Thanks, Tanya. That was great. Um, it's fun to see all of the work that we talk about all the time <laughs> condensed into a presentation. Yeah, you're like, man, she spent two seconds on that and that took way longer. <laughs> <laughs> well, and it was fun seeing some of the data from that like responders, non-responders manuscript and review. I'm because I'm working on a, a similar data set right now, but um goes without saying. But um I, I'll start off questions um for everyone. And so I I just read a review and I'm I'm getting interested while I'm trying to write the my like discussion of the um changes in like PYY following exercise particularly in what I'm writing right now. And it's talking about um, how exercise affects these hormones. Like what is actually, how does it do it? Like, is it because the hormones are released from the gut? So is it like, I was reading there's like gut motility or like, um, and there's lots of that happens with like the receptor, but like the actual release of the hormone and like that circulating through the blood, like what is, 
yeah what what actually creates it yeah 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 totally I think there's a lot of unanswered questions um regarding these actual mechanisms what we think plays a role is that amount of energy expenditure is one thing that's driving this release um and so that particularly with ghrelin so that's likely why in the uh, acute study that I showed where we compared a bout of resistance to aerobic to a sedentary condition, that's likely why the resistance exercise group was lower than the aerobic group, simply because the aerobic group was spend, expending more calories um, during that bout. Why the resistance exercise would be below the sedentary group, though, I don't really have any answer for that other than to say I think these studies need to be redone to see if that's like a valid is see if that's like a consistent and reliable outcome and I think that's where we get into trouble is there's just not a ton of studies looking at this particular resistance exercise and so we don't have consistent outcomes all the time and then it's hard to like get into mechanisms um so I think that actual degree of energy expenditure is one thing that seems to be driving it um, you mentioned the gastric motil or like motility. So that's definitely another part of it as well. But at the same time, it's going to be impacted by like, did we exercise in the fed state or did we exercise in the fasted state? Um, and so that's part of it as well. So there's just so many uh, variables that get in there and complicate these things. I would love at some point, um, you know, to work with people who are more like cellular molecular um, physiologists or biologists, and if we could take some biopsies from gastric, uh, bariatric, um, like gastric surgery patients, bariatric surgery patients, to look at like, okay, what is going on specifically in the portion of the stomach that we've removed? Like, do they just have less of these um, cells that are secreting some of these hormones or what is happening? Yeah. That's awesome. Super interesting. And I will say Celine has published on sex differences on this area as well. So if anyone wants to ask any sex differences questions, Celine can jump in and answer. Ooh, that would be interesting. Thanks yeah. for the prompt. I would love to hear that. <laughs> Go with Celine. Do you remember? Oh <laughs> uh, yeah. I mean, it was my master's thesis, and I used so the 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 trial that Tanya conducted it um, during her postdoc, it was the acute exercise. She showed, showed a few different interventions in her presentation, but so it was using that data set. It was a randomized crossover. It was 24 adults, 12 male, 12 female. And they, so they came in three different times and there was always a washout period. And that was for females, one month washout period and seven days for males. They came in one time they did an aerobic, you know, another time they either did the resistance or the sedentary control. And then we compared um, their exercise and their meal tests that we did or they did during the, those um, inter, those uh, experimental days. And there were no differences in any of the hormonal um, outcomes. So uh, ghrelin, PYY and GLP-1 were all very similar across, between the two sexes. But then hunger was um like so subjective rating on a visual analog scale like a sliding scale of hunger after they had their meal test was always lower in women and higher in in the males and then um similarly the prospective food consumption and levels of satiety were um higher prospective food consumption was higher in male lower in female so they all kind of linked up whereas the men were feeling hungrier and the women were feeling not as hungry but they all ate the same amount during their test lunch. Um, so the conclusion that we drew from that is that there's, um, you know, who knows if it was a social desirability, maybe just everyone overate in the lunch, but it was, it was a really, um, it was a, it was fun to find, have a finding for my master's thesis. So that was like the, the primary takeaway for me was like, wow, I found something cool and I get to now dive in and try to figure out, um, why this might be happening. But, yeah, there was a mixed match for male versus female for how hungry they felt versus how much they ate. And, um, but yeah, I, I hope yeah, that. Yeah, so potentially suggesting like men are better able to regulate energy intake in response to like their internal mm-hmm. hunger potentially. Um, the other thing that was interesting too, and I can't remember which way it went, but they, 
the hunger ratings, if you were to like put them in order for the resistance aerobic sedentary condition between men and women were like flip-flopped. Yeah, exactly. Do you remember like, was it men that were more hungry after aerobic or women? I think it, I think. Yeah, no, I can't say. I wouldn't. <laughs> <Yeah, laughs> but the order, like, if you were to rank order, like women were more hungry after one, that was like when men were the least hungry. It was interesting. So, so where does uh, circadian rhythm fit into all of this in terms of hormone measurements or or response to exercise? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, for the most part, so these hormones are produced endogenously. We always have some level of them circulating, but they tend to be really closely tied to meal consumption. So I don't know that they necessarily have an endogenous circadian component, but that would be interesting to look at. I was actually just talking with a prospective student about that who was interested in that topic the other day. Um, so I think that would be interesting to look at. We're, we're starting to become more interested in how exercise timing impacts some outcomes. Um, we, we're going to be starting up a study here this summer in older adults looking at how exercise in the AM or PM impacts glycemic control, so mm -hmm. risk of diabetes and also sleep outcomes. Um, but I think once we have approval to draw blood in our new research space, we don't right now because they put carpet everywhere and you can't draw blood on carpet. But um, once that's sorted out and we have some sinks added, um, we'll be able to get approval for blood draws there. And I think it would be interesting to see if, are there differences in any of these hormones or even just adding some um, appetite questionnaires, like do people feel hungrier in response to morning versus evening exercise and all of that? Cause we'll control their food intake throughout the day while they're with us. Uh Timing Does anyone else know? If anyone has any info on circadian <laughs> timing and appetite, I'd love to know. Um, Tanya, I had a question. So um, a lot of this research, including yours, really focuses on, on BMI um, and a healthy versus a not healthy BMI. Um, and a plethora of recent data has indicated that that doesn't apply to non-Caucasians. Um, and so BMIs that are unhealthy and Caucasians are perfectly metabolically and longevity, long, longevity wise healthy in uh, black individuals. Um, so what is the, the racial makeups of your uh, study groups and how applicable is this to the, the broader population? Yeah, so that's a great question. And I will say too, that also for um, Asian adults, they uh, a normal Caucasian body mass index would actually be considered elevated for that group as well. So it kind of goes across um, across the spectrum. Um, in the acute study that I showed you, we actually changed our criteria from being just based upon BMI to be based upon body fat percentage. So that way we were kind of taking out some of those like individual issues that happen with BMI. Um, that study, and as well as the training side, actually predominantly, um, predominantly Caucasian. And that's the challenge with a lot of this research is it used to be we were only doing research in men. And I think we've finally come along, at least in the clinical space, that you, you cannot just exclude women because they have a menstrual cycle or they go through menopause, you need to exclude them. But we don't do a great job of including um, racial and ethnic minorities. Um, and I think that is rightfully the tide is turning on that as it should and we have a lot more resources available now to help recruit different groups um and i think yeah that's going to be something that we absolutely need to do moving forward you know from a, just a whole organism standpoint what's what's uh, your take on the the Fitbit activity tracker business. Does that really make a difference? I, I, my take on it is that it, it's kind of preaching to the converted. But does, oh, does it, and it, like it helps increase yeah, it, physical right, activity. Right. Um, yeah, there has been data that has shown that, um, you know, if you were to give people, you know, something that tracks even just their steps, like a simple pedometer, um, they will acutely increase physical activity, but it tends to not be sustained so much. Um, however, 
you know, a lot of people have these devices that are tracking all of this now. So I don't think it's necessarily as novel to get some type of tracking device. Um, and I think you're right that the people who are paying attention to those numbers probably are the ones who are already meeting the physical activity guidelines and, you know, maybe didn't actually need that in order to do it. Um, I will say the issue that tends to happen a lot with these commercially based ones um, and that makes it hard for us to use as researchers is their algorithms are proprietary. And so, you know, we can use them to broadly track, but if the company changes their algorithm, we can't necessarily compare someone who did our intervention in October to someone who does our intervention several months later, if that was our primary outcome for physical activity. Um, and I can't, someone had said it earlier, I think it might've been Angie saying that uh, oftentimes these commercial devices will overestimate caloric expenditure from physical activity, which is challenging because then we typically as humans underestimate our caloric intake from food. And so it creates this challenging um, kind of mismatch there. Yeah. Did that answer your question? Yeah, thanks. Um, I'll go back to the, uh, one of the questions earlier I, about the um, circadian aspect. And in my reading, uh, how circadian aspect influences some of these appetite hormones is all so muddled by the, the study conditions in, in humans. So it's whether they're exercised in the fed or fasted, then they'll report like the, the circadian, the way that they're assessing the circadian um, regulation is like very um, not well lined up with the fed or fasted state, which is going to influence these hormones. So it's been really conflicting in, in the human literature. And then in vitro, they have shown, um, I think it was, they took the suprachiasmatic nucleus. Um, I don't know. It was they, they had it in culture. I can't remember the details exam exactly, but that's where one of the ideas began is because they saw that they could phase advance the release of ghrelin from the, from mm -hmm. the SDN. And so they're like, oh, then ghrelin must be circadian regulated, but it hasn't been shown um, like in a convincing way in humans from my reading. I don't know. Yeah. Yet. Yeah. I've never seen. So generally how we sort of like get at a circadian influence would be doing something that's called a constant routine in humans. And it's really regimented conditions where you'd have someone laying in a hospital bed, pretty much like very, very low light, consistent throughout. They stay awake for like an entire 24 hour or greater period. And every hour you kind of feed them like a small little snack just to kind of maintain energy balance throughout. Um, and they don't get up. So like posture doesn't change. Like to, you know, use the restroom, it's the bedpan. Um, and so then we can, and we're drawing blood usually like every hour. And so then you can see if there's been changes that happen kind of across the day. And as far as I haven't seen any of that with response or, you know, seen any of these appetite hormones using that constant routine, but it would be interesting if anyone, well, we couldn't, yeah. GLP-1, you have to you have to add a DPP-4 inhibitor to the blood as soon as it's drawn. Um, in ground, you have to add HCL to it before you freeze it. But if potentially if someone had some blood in a freezer that they'd done from a constant routine, we could go back and at least look at the PYY. So cool. Um, something that was back in, in Celine, you might be the right one to answer this. You said that you were um, testing men at one week and a woman after a month. And, I'm, and I would love to hear your explanation for that. I think I know, I'm assuming it has something to do with menstrual, menstrual cycles and stuff like that, but would love to hear. And if, that, if there's any concerns about that in terms of methodological rigor, given that I know nothing about this. So if that's a stupid question, sorry. <laughs> No, I think it's like one of the coolest questions because it is such a, I mean, that was one of the reasons that women were included in a lot of physiology based trials for so long it was like, oh, well, too bad. This is too confusing. We don't want to deal with this. We can't control for it. But yeah, the menstrual cycle, because you, you have, there was a few, there, I can't remember them now. I'm not as, um, it's been a while since I read it, but there's quite a few really great papers out there looking at 
looking at appetite and energy expenditure over the course of a menstrual cycle. And so it, it changes in your luteal and follicular phase. And um, so the washout period that I mentioned was so that all women were tested in the follicular phase. And um, it, this was just done through self-report, like diaries of logging their menstrual cycles. But um, then you also run into the, the issue of, okay, that's great. We've figured out how to like maybe control for phase, but then now we also have birth control. Like are, the, are people on birth control? And it's really hard to exclude women who are on hormonal birth control because then you lose like a lot of your participants and it's already hard to recruit, especially when we're looking at a specific population, like people with obesity who are interested in exercise. Like now we have even thinned it out more by saying you can't be on a hormonal birth control. So um, that study had women with hormonal birth control, but um, in that, you know, it's going to affect a lot of these, these outcomes, whether it's the behavior or the biology, but um, yeah, I think it's super interesting to start teasing about part of those pieces as well. Yeah. And we probably should have been consistent and just had men come every month as well. Um, but we were a little worried we would lose them, <laughs> not they would drop out of the study. Um, because in general, it's easier to recruit women for any of these types of studies. And we tend to struggle to get men in. And so we were like, well, if we can get them done with everything in a month to five weeks, then maybe we won't have so many drops. So, so I do, <laughs> there is um, some evidence. So part of my work is on sex difference, actually large chunk of my work is on sex differences. Um, and so there are fluctuations in males as well, um, in testosterone levels, in progesterone levels, um, some driven by stress, others driven by um, anything that activates the immune system, so colds, uh, et cetera. Um, and so there would probably be benefit into repeatedly testing males and correlating them with hormonal levels. Yeah. Uh, in our metabolic disease models, we see effects on males that get extra progesterone. Um, so there's obviously a progesterone, a huge progesterone component to uh, metabolic activity at the cellular level, which usually does end up correlating with whole body. Oh, cool. Yeah. Yeah. And that was another limitation that we didn't measure any, like we didn't. Um, collect because you'd have to collect urine daily essentially to figure out like when you're exactly in the follicular and luteal phase. So we didn't do that for the women either. Um but yeah that would be is that do you do that through would you do that through urine and men or blood draw? Um depends on what you want to look at. Uh progesterone is pretty easy to correlate with a PGD metabolite that can be detected in the urine. Okay. Um there's a delay in increase in PGD with increase in serum progesterone, but it's a at least in women, which is where it's yeah. the most well studied. Um, it's the, the delay in time is known. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm pretty sure that one could take the time to do a pilot to figure out yeah. the correlation between male urinary PGD and uh, serum progesterone, but estrogen's a little trickier. Um, there are also men that Overmake estrogen, right? Yeah. But uh, progesterone is the easiest. Oh, awesome. Thank you. This is just really cool. So thank you. It was nice. That, you know, it's just a really interesting study. And so what would you, if you were thinking, because you, you kind of briefly alerted, um, alluded to uh, implementation science, right, um, which is the world, I, I don't do implementation science because it's way too hard and only crazy people want to do implementation uh, science. Uh, yeah. I do not want to work that hard, um, yeah. but I'm kind of like this, just a teeny step behind implementation uh, um, is what, like if you had your ideal, right, knowing what you know about physical activity. I'm sure you know a lot about diet. Like how would you, what kind of interventions would you try to think about? And this is what we do for you guys in the bridge reports, right? So Tanya's probably, I don't know if you consider discovery or demonstration. And then this would be like the, the, the third one, dissemination, right? And so I'm just curious, like, you know, not that you're going to do that work because that's not your jam, but like, what, what would you like to see? How do you like somebody to take your work and go to the next sphere? Yeah, so I, so I would put myself more, yeah, in the demonstration, kind of clinical sphere. 
Um, well, so I think like if you were to take this, like what's the next step is like, how can we integrate some interventions that have been efficacious for weight management into clinical settings um, that are easy for patients to sort of engage with, easy for pro providers to provide and track. Um, and so I know I like at Madsen, you know, there's health coaches that are integrated into that. And so things like that, I think are perfect. Um, however, that's still is that's still focusing on like only a group of people who like have access right to that who are privileged um and in general i think we would need to go like way beyond just dissemination into like how is our society structured right to like help make us more active to help improve the food environment um and that's yeah i don't even know where to begin <laughs> with that but you know a lot of like policy based things is like we know that exercise is good. We know that a healthy diet is good, but we are asking people to make better individual choices when faced with systemic issues. Um, and so, yes, yeah, so I don't have a great answer for how I would get there, but I think in general, that's what it would take. Yeah, I think it's a little bit what we're trying to do on the wellness bus, right, is to do health coaching in our underserved communities where 65 percent of the people who come to our bus don't have insurance yeah you know a large percentage probably around 50 percent don't speak english as a first language right so that you know but again you know it's not a it's it's better than nothing and totally. i think you know we have you know really good trained people yeah. we have, have health coaches and stuff like that as well in community health workers right especially people who speak their language yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's one way we could, you know, doing some of that, right? Because that's open to everyone. 